Hello and welcome to the history of Star Trek. Today's episode, the Enterprise NX-01. One of the most important starships in interstellar history, the Enterprise NX-01, was the culmination of the NX project. The NX-01 was the first NX-class starship launched by the United Earth Starfleet in 2151. Enterprise established United Earth as a legitimate interstellar power and caused a wholesale revolution in the Alpha and Beta Quadrant policies, paving the way for the creation of the Coalition of Planets in 2155, and eventually the United Federation of Planets in 2161. Development for humanity to make space exploration missions possible within a single natural lifetime, humans had to make themselves capable of traveling faster than warp 1, the speed of light. After Zephyr and Cochran made a successful warp flight in the Phoenix in 2063, the propulsion system he had created was further developed. In 2119, several engineers such as Henry Archer and Cochran himself began work that paved the way directly to the Enterprise at the Warp 5 complex in Bozeman, Montana. Over the next 32 years, the warp engine development continued until humanity's first Warp 5 engine was created. This engine was capable of speeds that finally made interstellar travel in more survivable periods possible. That is, in days, weeks, or months instead of years. Consequently, humanity was able to construct its first Warp 5 capable starship, the Enterprise, completed in 2151. Initially, Enterprise had a theoretical maximum speed of warp 4.5. Aside from its engine, Enterprise was also the first Earth vessel to be equipped with a transporter rated for transporting biological organisms. However, the machine malfunctioned a number of times before the initial bugs were worked out. The preferred method of travel was still the shuttle pod, unless other options were exhausted. After trips in the pod, it was standard procedure for the returning crew and passengers to utilize the decontamination chamber. The ship was not as advanced in all areas. However, unlike the Vulcan ships of its day, it did not possess tractor beams, merely magnetic grapplers. The Enterprise had a standard crew complement of 83 humans, with the addition of a Vulcan and a Denobulan, approximately one-third of the crew was female. Prior to its launch, Captain Gardner was considered for the command of the Enterprise, regarded as the most suitable choice by Ambassador Soval. Admiral Maxwell Forrest ultimately narrowed down the candidates for captaincy to Jonathan Archer and A.G. Robinson. Instead, though, pointing out that the Vulcan High Command was not in charge of Starfleet's personnel assignments. In 2150, the year her keel was laid, Forrest finally selected Archer. The historical significance of Enterprise was related in drawings of the ship that hung in Archer's ready room. The image was part of a series of paintings depicting the historical lineage of the ships called Enterprise. Following the Broken Bow incident in April 2151, the launch of the Enterprise was rearranged three weeks ahead of schedule. The reason the ship's maiden voyage was brought forward was that United Earth needed to return Klang, a Klingon, to his home world of Kronos. The phase cannons were not installed until September of 2151 while the Enterprise battled an unknown enemy. When a Maserite ship attacked the Enterprise in February 2152, the first shot disabled Enterprise's aft sensors. The Enterprise reached warp 5 for the first time while attempting to outrun the Maserite ship and carrying Vulcan Ambassador. Valar. By March of 2152, ten months after launching, Enterprise had engaged in armed conflicts with more than a dozen species. That month, the ship's mission was cancelled when one of its shuttle pods appeared to have ignited tetrazine gas within the atmosphere of Paragon II, killing 3,600 innocent colonists. It was this event, along with the ship's actions at the planets including Pajem and Tandar Prime, that caused the Starfleet Command Council to recall Enterprise to Earth. Ambassador Saval recommended that the United Earth wait another 10 or 20 years before trying another deep space exploration mission. Captain Archer was able to convince the Starfleet Command Council and the Vulcan High Command to allow Enterprise to continue, particularly after it was revealed that the accident had been triggered by the Suliban Cabal. By September 18, 2152, Enterprise had traveled over 100 light years from Earth. In order to transverse a neutronic storm, which reached the ship on that date, the ship's structural integrity was reinforced and the craft's power grid was deactivated, illuminating all shipboard areas only in blue emergency lights. These modifications were made by the crew who took refuge in the vessel's catwalk together with their belongings. 
To accommodate the crew, the ship's warp reactor was shut down and numerous modifications were made to the catwalk. For example, command of the vessel was transferred from the main bridge to the temporary command post in one of the catwalk's compartments. The engineering team had only four hours to make the necessary changes. Upon addressing the crew with the initial speech, whose audio was broadcast from the makeshift command area, Archer referred to the Enterprise as the sturdiest ship in Starfleet. After the Zindi attacked Earth in March of 2153, Enterprise was recalled home. Arriving on April 24th, Enterprise was refitted and upgraded with the new photonic torpedoes, enhanced hull plating, a universal translator update, and a new command center. The ship also took on board a detachment of Makos before being relaunched on a new mission to the Delphonic Expanse to search for the Zindi weapon. The search for the Zindi was long and perilous, taking almost a year. Enterprise was in danger most of the time in the Expanse due to the presence of spatial anomalies generated by massive spheres in the region. It was discovered that insulating the hull with Trillium D could protect the ship from the anomalies, but unfortunately Trillium was hazardous to Vulcan's neural pathways and Captain Archer refused to let Sub-Commander T'Pol leave the ship. Hence, the shielding could not be used. In February of 2154, Enterprise determined the location of the Zendi weapon and arrived in the Azari Prime system. There, the ship suffered severe damage due to attacks by multiple Zendi vessels. The ship's primary warp coil was destroyed, damage that required Captain Archer to eventually attack a Lyran ship. The craft had a warp coil that Enterprise could use which would let them arrive on time to a meeting with Degra. Enterprise might have endured even more damage in the Delphonic Expanse, if not for the intervention of an alternate future version of the Enterprise, which had traveled 117 years into the past when attempting to use a subspace corridor. Enterprise accomplished its mission to destroy the Zindi weapon successfully, though Captain Archer was presumed to have died when the weapon had exploded. The starship was returned to Earth by a Zindi aquatic cruiser following the end of the mission. Though Enterprise made a slight detour to an alternate version of 1944 with the help of Temporal Agent Daniels. During this mission, Archer rejoined the ship after stopping Vosk's attempt to return to his own time and subsequently bringing an end to the Temporal Cold War that had so long plagued the Enterprise's missions. The crew of the Enterprise spent nearly 10 months in the Delphonic Expanse during their mission to find the Zindi. From April 24, 2153 to February 2154. During those 10 months, 27 Enterprise crew members died in the search for the Zindi weapon. The members of the Enterprise crew were hailed as heroes upon returning to Earth, especially Captain Archer, for whom several schools were named. Enterprise was placed in a dry dock where it began an extensive repair and refit. Modifications to the ship included a new captain's chair, an upgrade to the transporter, and repainted door panels. In May 2154, a group of rogue augments left over from Earth's eugenics war stole a Klingon bird of prey and killed its entire crew. The Klingon Empire threatened United Earth with war, unless the augments were apprehended. After a debriefing and refit, Enterprise was launched with Arkin Soon on board to try to hunt down the Augments on the border of the Orion Syndicate. After several brief firefights with the Orion Interceptors, the Augments found Enterprise, took Soon aboard their ship, and set course to Cold Station 12. Enterprise pursued but failed to stop Soon from taking thousands of onboard Augment embryos. Soon then headed to the Briar Patch. However, the Augments had turned on him and headed to a Klingon colony to attempt the release of several types of pathogens into the atmosphere. Enterprise arrived in time to stop the Augments, destroying them and their bird of prey. The NX Enterprise was also present when Earth's leadership announced new trade relations with Vulcan, Andoria, Tellar, and Horden in July 2155. The members of Enterprise crew were hailed as heroes, laying the groundwork for that alliance, a precursor to the formation of the United Federation of Planets. During this conference, the crew was instrumental in thwarting the militant Terra Prime organization, preventing efforts to eject all non-humans after Terra Prime hijacked the Mars Verderon array. The Enterprise was retired in 2161 to make way for new, more advanced starships. It was then placed in the Federation Museum, where it still remained in the 24th century. Thank you for watching the history of the NX-01 Enterprise. Special thanks to Memory Alpha for all information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you have, thank you. And have a nice day. Bye-bye.
Hello and welcome to the history of the USS Enterprise, NCC-1701. The USS Enterprise was a 23rd century Constitution-class starship operated by Starfleet. In the course of her career, the Enterprise became the most celebrated starship of her time. In her 40 years of service and discovery, through the upgrades and at least two refits, she took part in numerous first contacts, military engagements, and time travels. She achieved her most lasting fame from a five-year mission, 2265 to 2270, under the command of Captain James T. Kirk. Service History Construction In the early to mid-23rd century, at least 12 heavy cruiser-type starships, the Constitution class, were commissioned by Starfleet. Constructed at the San Francisco Fleet Yards in San Francisco, California, the Federation vessel registered NCC-1701 was christened the Enterprise, in a long line of ships of the same name. Captain Robert April oversaw the construction of the ship's components as well as her initial trial runs. Larry Mavick was stated to be one of the designers of the Enterprise herself while Dr. Richard Daystrom designed its computer systems. Robert April's Command The Enterprise was launched in 2245 under the command of Captain Robert April, with Christopher Pike serving as Captain Robert April's first officer. Christopher Pike's Command As Captain Christopher Pike commanded the Enterprise from 2250 to 2265, his missions included the voyages to Rigel, Rega, and the Thalos system. Pike's half-Vulcan science officer Spock, who served under him for over 11 years, ultimately became the starship's longest-serving officer. James T. Kirk's command. In 2265, the Enterprise was assigned to another five-year mission of deep space exploration, and command was passed to James T. Kirk. The ship's primary goal during the mission was to seek out and contact alien life. Captain Kirk's standing orders also include the investigation of all quasars and quasar-like phenomenon. Beyond its primary mission, the Enterprise defended the Federation territories from aggression, aided member worlds in crisis, and provided scientific expeditions and colonies in her patrol area, with annual examinations and support. Discoveries from 2265 to 2270, the Enterprise visited over 70 different worlds and encountered representatives of over 60 different species. More than 20 of those were first contacts with beings previously unknown to the Federation, including stellar neighbors like the First Federation and Gorn, voyagers from the Kelvin Empire in the distant Andromeda, and powerful non-corporeal entities like the Thasians, Trilene, and the Organans. Two discovered species were the first known examples of silicone-based life forms, the Horda and the Excalibans. The Enterprise was the first Federation vessel to survive an encounter with the Galactic Barrier. The ship's warp drive and other systems, however, were critically damaged and casualties totaled 12 crew members and officers. By stardate 4657.5, the Enterprise was traveling through space in a region hundreds of light years further than any Earth starship had explored. The reality of time travel, externally influenced, had been known for over a century. But following two accidental temporal displacements, the Enterprise became the Federation's first deliberately controlled time ship. Observing the death throes of the PSI-2000, the crew suffered from polywater intoxication, and the Enterprise nearly lost orbit after an engine shutdown. A previously untested cold start via controlled matter-antimatter implosion saved the ship, but the high-speed escape from the planet's gravity well caused the ship to travel three days into the past. In 2267, while escaping the gravitational pull of a black star, the Enterprise was hurled through space and time to Earth of 1969. The crew developed and executed a method to return to their own time by warping around the sun's gravity well in a slingshot maneuver. A year later, the Enterprise was ordered to repeat 
the recently proven slingshot event and return to Earth's past on a mission of historical observation. Some missions of discovery confronted Enterprise with entities and mechanisms that threatened great swaths of Federation and neighboring space. An ancient planet killer, fueled by the consumption of planets it destroyed with its anti-proton weapon, approached Federation population centers in 2267. It required the combined efforts of the Enterprise and her sister ship, the USS Constellation, to destroy it. One year later, in 2268, a single-celled organism of colossal scale emitted negative energy, toxic to humanoid life killing the entire Vulcan crew of the USS Intrepid. The Enterprise penetrated the cell's interior and destroyed the organism before its imminent cell division threatened to overwhelm the rest of the galaxy. Battles The nature of its mission of exploration meant that the Enterprise was frequently the only Federation military asset in a little-known, otherwise undefended frontier. When called into harm's way, the ship regularly did so with little chance of imminent support against previously unknown enemies and threats. Happily, the Enterprise's earliest engagements of its five-year mission against a deceptively powerful starship called the Fessorus ended with an amicable first contact with the First Federation in 2266. Following the destruction of a colony on Cestus III, a surprise attack from a previously unknown species led the Enterprise to battle and pursue an evenly matched Gorn starship in 2267. The Enterprise played a fox for four of her sister ships in a war games problem on Stardate 4729.4 as part of the M5 drills. Equipped with the new M5 Multitronic unit computer and stripped of most of her crew, the Enterprise became a killing machine, crippling the USS Excalibur and killing its entire crew before Kirk could reassert control. Casualties. Service aboard the Enterprise proved to be hazardous duty. Between 2265 and 2269, Individuals who were killed while assigned to the ship included at least 58 officers and crew, 13.5% of the standard complement of 430. Background Information The Enterprise and its interiors were designed primarily by Matt Jeffries. A three-foot demonstration model was completed in November 1964 by the Howard Anderson Company to show to Gene Roddenberry. After getting his approval, an 11-foot model was then constructed and was finished in December 1964. The 11-foot model was modified for TOS, where no man has gone before, and again for the regular series effect shots. Reused footage of all three stages of the 11-foot's model appearance are seen mixed together in TOS. Thank you for watching the history of the USS Enterprise. Special thanks to Memory Alpha for all information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can, if you already have. Thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to the History of Star Trek. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the Enterprise NCC-1701 after its refit. And here we go. In the late 2260s to early 2270s, the Constellation class underwent a major refit program. The actual refitting took 18 months of work and essentially a new vessel was built onto the bones of the old replacing virtually every major system, ensuring their continued service for the next several years, with the USS Enterprise continuing to serve in a prominent role. In the early 2270s, the Enterprise was critical in defending the Federation from several external threats, including the V'ger probe and Khan Nulian Singh. System upgrades with new technologies after long deployments were far from unusual in the ship's history. However, the Enterprise's overhaul of the early 2270s became a nearly keel-up redesign and construction project. 
The very heart of the ship was replaced with a radically different vertical warp core assembly. Likened to new and heavier warp engine cells, atop swept back pylons and integrated with the impulse engines. The new drive system allowed for an expanded cargo hull and the secondary hull linked to the shuttle bay. Weapon system upgrades included nine dual phaser banks with power channel directly from the warp engines. A double photon torpedo probe launcher was installed atop the secondary hull. Multiple egress points now include a port side space dock hatch, dual ventral space walk bays, four dorsal service hatches, and a standardized docking ring port aft of the bridge of the secondary hull. Four more docking port rings paired on the port and starboard sides of the launcher and secondary hulls respectively, and service hatch airlocks on the port and starboard sides of the hangar bay's main clamshell doors. A new bridge model reflected the modern computer systems, operating interfaces, and ergonomics that ran throughout the ship. Following Kirk's promotion to Rear Admiral and posting as Chief of Starfleet Operations, his successor, Captain William Decker, oversaw the refit, assisted by Chief Engineer Commander Montgomery Scott. After 18 months in space dock for refit, the Enterprise was pressed into service weeks ahead of schedule in response to the V'ger crisis once again under Kirk's command. Decker was temporarily demoted to commander and posted as the executive officer because of his familiarity with the new design. Incomplete systems had to be serviced during the vessel's shakedown cruise en route to Viger, including the test flight of the new warp engines. Shortly after launch, a matter-antimatter intermix malfunction ruptured the warp field and led to the Enterprise entering an unstable wormhole. Commander Decker belayed an order from Admiral Kirk to destroy an asteroid in their path, which had been dragged into the ruptured warp field along with them, with phasers. The refit phasers now channel power directly from the main engines at a point beyond the dilithium magnetonic iterator stage. Because of this refitted function, the intermix malfunction and the antimatter imbalance within the warp nacelles that had resulted caused an automatic cutoff of the phasers a design change of which Kirk had not been aware. Decker ordered the use of photon torpedoes instead. As a backup, they had been designed to draw power from a separate system in case of a major power loss. The timely arrival of Commander Spock brought correction to the intermix problem. Once the V'ger threat was averted, Captain Decker was listed as missing in action, and the Enterprise remained under Admiral Kirk's command for an interim period. At some point, Kirk passed command on to the newly promoted Captain Spock. The new design and components tested and proven on board the Enterprise influenced a generation of Starship design, from the Miranda class to the Constellation class, as well as other retrofitted constitutions. Khan's return. In 2285, the Enterprise was in a low-tempo training cycle, based in the Sol system. Admiral Kirk boarded his old command to observe a cadet training cruise. Meanwhile, Khan Nulian Singh had escaped from his exile on CD Alpha 5 and hijacked the USS Reliant, leading to the theft of the Genesis device from Regula 1 space station. The Enterprise was tasked to investigate, and Spock deferred his command to Admiral Kirk. Subsequent engagements with the Reliant left the ship badly damaged, with cadet and crew deaths, including Captain Spock. Returning to Genesis and Destruction Upon the Enterprise returning to Earth, Starfleet Commander-in-Chief Admiral Harry Morrow announced that the starship at that point was 40 years old and would be decommissioned. When Morrow denied Kirk's requesting permission to return to the Mutara sector, Kirk conspired with the senior officers and stole the Enterprise from the Earth space dock in order to recover Spock's body from the Genesis planet to bring it and Spock's Katra, the latter possessed by Leonard McCoy, to Vulcan. As part of the plan, Kirk and Scott rig up an automatic system to run the Enterprise so easily that a chimpanzee and two trainees could have handled the craft. At the Enterprise's destination, the ship was attacked by a Klingon bird of prey operated by Klingon Commander Krug, an assault that left the Enterprise disabled. Scotty's automation system was not designed for combat and overloaded when the ship was attacked. 
After setting the auto-destruct sequence, Kirk and his crew abandoned ship for the surface of the Genesis planet. Demolition charges in the place of the bridge and everywhere else throughout the ship's saucer section exploded, killing a Klingon boarding party. The secondary hull fell from orbit, streaking across the planet's atmosphere. And thus, the Enterprise went out in a blaze of glory. Thank you for watching the history of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701 refit. Special thanks to Memory Alpha for all information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Greetings and welcome to the history of the USS Enterprise NCC-17018. In 2286, the Enterprise A was commissioned at the San Francisco Yards on Stardate 8442.5. She was launched from the Earth Space Dock on the order of the Federation Council. In appreciation of Captain James T. Kirk and his crew's effort to prevent the whale probe from devastating Earth, the crew initially thought that they were going to be assigned to the USS Excelsior, or according to Leonard McCoy, a freighter at best. But the new Enterprise was soon revealed. Docked behind the Excelsior, the crew took their station, and the Enterprise left space dock on a shakedown cruise. The shakedown did not go as planned and the Enterprise limped back to space dock for several weeks of repair under the supervision of Captain Montgomery Scott. Although her warp drive was working perfectly, half the doors on the ship were malfunctioning and several control interfaces did not work. The transporter was also non-functional, requiring shuttlecrafts to be used for off-ship missions. Before the repairs were complete, the Enterprise was called into duty in order to intervene in a kidnapping situation on Nimbus 3. The ship was subsequently commandeered by the rogue Vulcan Cybok, who ordered her to the center of the Milky Way galaxy in order to pursue the mythical Shakari. During the return of Cybok to the ship on board the Galileo, Commander Hakaru Sulu was forced to crash the shuttle into the Enterprise landing bay as the ship was being pursued by Klingon Bird of Prey, commanded by Claw, and there was no time to use the tractor beam for a safe entrance. The Bird of Prey followed the Enterprise to the center of the galaxy. The crew was too involved with Cybok's visit to the planetoid found there and did not notice the Klingon vessel entering sensor range. The Bird of Prey caught the Enterprise off guard and disabled her before she had a chance to retaliate. However, the Klingon Ambassador Korg Rescued from Nimbus 3, relieved Captain Claw and ordered the Bird of Prey to stand down. The Klingon crew was later invited to a reception following the return of the Enterprise to Kirk's control and discovery that Shakari was a myth. The brig was also damaged during the mission as Captain Scott blew a hole in the back wall to free Captain Kirk, Spock, and Dr. McCoy. Spock also kept a picture of himself and his friends taken on the bridge of the Enterprise A from this time for the next century until his death in 2263 of the alternate reality. Gaseous Anomaly Project Starfleet began a fleet-wide research project into the investigation of gaseous planetary anomalies in the early 2290s. The Enterprise was one of several starships to be outfitted with advanced equipment for their study. In 2293, the Enterprise was due to be retired, along with most of her command crew. However, she was pressed back into service for one last mission as an escort for Klingon Chancellor Gorkon. During the initial stages of the Kittimer Accords, the ship rendezvoused with the Klingon flagship Kronos-1, 
and was to follow it to Earth. Unfortunately, a joint Starfleet, Klingon, and Romulan conspiracy had an operative, Lieutenant Valeris, on board the ship. Valeris participated in a plan to implicate the Enterprise and Captain Kirk as rogue assailants in Gorkon's murder, with the goal of derailing the peace process. The Enterprise appeared to have fired two photon torpedoes at Kronos-1, temporarily disabling her propulsion and gravity systems. Amid the chaos, two space-suited Starfleet crew members, Burke and Samno, beamed aboard, assassinating Gorkon. Valeris altered the ship's records to make it seem as if the two torpedoes had been fired. The torpedoes actually came from a cloaked prototype bird of prey directly below the Enterprise which had been modified to fire while cloaked. Kirk and McCoy were arrested and tried for the murder and sentenced to life imprisonment on the penal colony Rurapente. Valeris also provided Kirk's log entries from the Enterprise to the Klingon co-conspirators to further implicate Kirk. The Enterprise was ordered back to Earth, but Spock ignored the orders and indicated an investigation on board the ship. He discovered evidence which linked Valeris to the conspiracy, despite her best efforts to sabotage the investigation. The Enterprise then entered Klingon space, masquerading as a Klingon freighter, and rescued Kirk and McCoy. Spock mind-melded with Valeris and learned more about the conspiracy, including details of the bird of prey and the names of those involved. Captain Sulu on board the USS Excelsior provided Kirk with the new location of the peace conference and the two ships warped to Kittimer in order to prevent a second assassination of the Federation President and the new Klingon Chancellor. General Chain was waiting in orbit with his bird of prey, however, and the Enterprise was attacked upon arrival. The starship was seriously damaged and suffered a hull breach through the saucer section. The Excelsior II was helpless against the cloaked ship. Fortunately, Spock, McCoy, and Uhura devised a plan to use a photon torpedo equipped with sensors capable of tracking ionization from the Bird of Prey's impulse engines. It successfully hit Chang's vessel, knocking it out of the cloak and leaving it vulnerable to further photon torpedo volleys from the Enterprise and the Excelsior. Following the destruction of the Bird of Prey, the Enterprise and Excelsior crews beamed down to the Kittimer Conference and apprehended the conspirators, preventing the assassination. Following the Kittimer mission, the Enterprise was ordered by Starfleet Command to return to space dock to be decommissioned. Captain Kirk ordered the ship on course to the second star to the right and straight on till morning. Kirk later recorded in his log that the Enterprise and her crew will shortly become the care of another crew. The next USS Enterprise, the Excelsior class USS Enterprise B, was launched later that year. Apocrypha. According to the paperwork with the Bandai model kits, the Enterprise A was mothballed into Memory Alpha's museum fleet. Scotty's comments in Relics would seem to support this. In the comic TNG Special 3, the Enterprise A was on display at Starbase 122. Starfleet Museum in 2369, where it was visited by Montgomery Scott after his rescue from the Dyson Sphere in Relics. According to William Shatner's novel, The Ashes of Eden, the Enterprise A was sold by Starfleet to the defense forces of planet Shar, who appointed the now-retired James Kirk as its commander. The vessel was later destroyed in the corona of Shar's son during the battle with the Klingon battlecruisers. These events are later referenced in the novel Cast No Shadow. Thank you for watching the history of the USS Enterprise A. Special thanks to Memory Alpha for providing all information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already have, thank you, and have a nice day. Bye-bye.
The History of the Enterprise B. For this history episode, we're going to Memory Beta Online, and we're going to check out canon and non-canon sources such as books and comic books. And here we go. The USS Enterprise, NCC-1701B, sometimes referred to as the Enterprise B, was a Federation Excelsior-class explorer in service in Starfleet in the late 23rd and early 24th centuries. She was launched in the year 2293 under the command of Captain John Harrisman. She was later commanded by William George, Demora Sulu, and Thomas Johnson, Jr. Over the course of the Enterprise B's service, she was remembered as the key figure in exploring beyond the Gamori sector, mapping over 142 star systems, making first contact with 17 different civilizations. The Enterprise served as the flagship of the Federation. The Enterprise B was also the first starship Enterprise in 30 years that did not have Captain James T. Kirk in command of the vessel. History Construction the Enterprise was built at the Antares shipyards. USS Excelsior was highly controversial. However, Starfleet decided to use it both for economic and technical reasons, as the Excelsior had shown that it could withstand the test of time. Indeed, they would still be in service nearly a century after first being developed. Maiden Voyage By 2293, construction work on the Enterprise had been completed with only a few components needing to be installed, such as tractor beam and loading of photon torpedoes. Despite this, the Enterprise B was launched from dry dock orbiting Earth. On a maiden voyage, with three honored guests on board, in the form of Captain James T. Kirk and Montgomery Scott and Commander Pavel Chekhov, as well as a large number of journalists. Although the maiden voyage was just meant to be a short trip out of Pluto and back again, the Enterprise received a distress call from two Federation transport ships, who were bringing Elorian refugees back to Earth. Although not fully equipped, there were no other vessels in range, and Captain Harrisman reluctantly gave the order to intercept them. Upon arrival, the Enterprise discovered that the transports had been trapped in an energy ribbon called the Nexus, and the starship herself became ensnared in when moving into transporter range. Unfortunately, the Enterprise was too late to help the crew of one transport, the USS Robert Fox, as it exploded and was only able to rescue 47 of the 150 people aboard the USS Lacoul before it too was destroyed. Captain Scott devised a way to free the ship using a resonance burst from the deflector disc to simulate an antimatter explosion after a plan to use torpedoes was discarded, as there weren't any on board. Captain Kirk went to deflector control in order to make necessary modifications as the Enterprise secondary hull was struck by an energy tendril. The Enterprise escaped with minor casualties and a major hull breach along sections 20 through 28 on decks 13 through 15. Kirk was believed killed in the breach and the mission became notorious due to his loss. An inquiry followed, clearing Harris men of any blame although several former members of Kirk's crew held him to account. From the TOS novel, The Captain's Daughter. At some point by 2294, Harrisman would have a dedication plaque for Kirk installed in the area where he was at the time believed to be killed. After obtaining a Borel-class Klingon bird of prey, the Montgomery Scott of the future traveled back in time from 2370 to 2293 to transport Kirk off the Enterprise B at the moment where he was believed lost, but the action caused an alternate timeline to form, erasing the Federation from history. The timeline was restored when Kirk was returned to the Nexus. Star Trek novel, Engines of Destiny. In early 2294, during the first mission following the loss of Captain Kirk six months previous, the Enterprise B was sent to deal with an outbreak of Telerian plague in the Antares system with Dr. Leonard McCoy on board as chief medical advisor. En route, the starship confronted a renegade Klingon warship, the Katang class IKS Vengeance, whose captain intentionally released the plague to lure the Federation into violating Article 6 of the recent Kittimer Accords. Harrisman defeated the enemy ship by transporter swapping the Enterprise entire complement of photon torpedoes 
for Klingon crew. The battle cruiser was destroyed and the enemy crew captured. Captain's Log comic, Captain Log Harrisman. After the losses on its maiden voyage, the Enterprise was commanded by Captain William George for a deep space tour beyond the Gomori sector that mapped 142 star systems and made 17 first contacts. In the late 2290s decade, Captain Harrisman again assumed command of the Enterprise. At some point during or after 2293, the Enterprise B landing party was under the command of Ensign Demora Sulu who marched into an ambush by the Brivent race on Beta Orvis III, with Sulu nearly paying for her mistake with her life. In 2303, Captain John Harrisman and Lieutenant Commander Demora Sulu departed the Enterprise B at Starbase 23 under the guise of personal leap, but secretly they were headed towards the Romulan Star Empire on a covert mission for Starfleet intelligence. The mission was to monitor for indications of advanced cloaking technology within the Romulan space. Command of the starship was turned over to Captain D-Man Renaud while Harrisman and Sulu were gone. For eight weeks, the two displaced some 173 hours into the future due to a temporal encounter with a star-designated Odyssey. After this displacement, Harrisman and Sulu returned to Starbase 23 via Foxtrot 3 monitoring station and retook command of the Enterprise. This was from Star Trek The Lost Era novel, One Constant Star. In 2307, the Enterprise underwent a rather extensive refit at Starbase 11 in an effort to bring it up to standards in respect to the new Romulan class vessels. Several significant crew transfers took place, among them the arrival of a Boslik officer. At some point during the same year, both the Enterprise and Excelsior crews shared an overlapping shore leave at Starbase 11. Not long afterwards, the Enterprise refit was complete and the Starship returned to active service. Three years later, in 2310, as part of refit efforts stipulated in the Kittimer Accords, the Enterprise delivered supplies to 4,000 indigents on the planet Kwakliag in coordination with Commander King aboard the IKS Katanko. However, upon arrival, Captain Harrison's crew discovered that the planetary population held in thrall of a corrupt Klingon governor who refused to accept the relief supplies. The next day, both the Starfleet and Klingon vessels were shocked to discover the entire planet massacred by the governor. Their throats slit simply because they prove a risk to his crooked schemes. Filled with disgust, Harrisman's ship departed Klingon space. Captain Harrisman remained in command of the Enterprise until 2311 when the ship played a key role during the Tomed incident. Following the incident, Harrisman stepped down and gave command to his first officer, Demora Sulu. TLE novel, Serpents Among the Ruins. The Starfleet Operation Manual stated that John Harrisman's tenure as captain of the Enterprise lasted five years from 2293 to 2298. The Star Trek reference USS Enterprise Owner's Operational Manual has apparently retconned the 2293 to 2298 tour to William George, with Harrisman second in command running 2298 to 2311. In 2311, on her first mission as captain of the Enterprise B, Demora Sulu ran into unspecified trouble during a voyage to the Ron Tinge Wall. At some point, not long after the Tomed incident, the Enterprise B crew, under Sulu's command, spent two years studying the De Bruni ruins in the Baracus system. This mission presumably lasted no later than 2315. Sulu's first command of the Enterprise lasted until 2315 when she took a leave of absence to care for her terminally, terminally ill parental grandmother. During this leave, the Enterprise set off on a year-long exploration mission, which became wildly successful and earned the new captain a promotion to admiral. Sulu returned to the ship and remained in command for several years thereafter. On a mission to A Moon in the Desirelli's Loop aboard the Enterprise B prior to 2319, Demora Sulu narrowly escaped death by both drowning and hypothermia. 
In 2318, the Enterprise B, under Captain Demora Sulu's command, participated in a first contact mission on Beta Vera 4, but without the participation of the freshly certified contact specialist, Hawkins Young. That was from the Star Trek The Lost Era novel, One Constant Star. Starting in either late 2318 or early 2319, the Enterprise was assigned to explore an unclaimed, unaligned region of space near the Zinkathi Coalition, and was ordered to void all contact when possible with the Zinkarthi ships. With no return date specified, the Starship conducted exploratory missions in the regions. Equipped with a dozen Class H shuttlecraft, two Garin class warp shuttles, and a half dozen cargo management units. Two months into the voyage, a massive construct was discovered in the Jothori Limbari star system, whose exploration ultimately cost the Enterprise, among other things, a loss of shuttlecraft, the Ericsson. Ten months passed by when the Enterprise discovered planet Regeris II, located within the region and planet side and an interdimensional portal whose previous activation in 2308 resulted in the loss of the USS Excelsior. Attempting to rescue a stranded crewman on the planet located in a parallel universe on the other side of the portal, Captain Demora Sulu herself became trapped along with two of the Enterprise shuttlecrafts. In an attempt to mount a rescue mission involving the Enterprise and the USS Castopedia, Admiral Harrisman used the Castopedia to destroy the Regeran portal before an overwhelming Zakathian attack force could claim it and cross over and board the Enterprise. Both Demora and Hikatu Sulu, as well as over 500 stranded Excelsior crew were rescued. The Enterprise B ultimately returned to its home universe, albeit some three weeks prior to the original discovery of the portal. After 11 months of transition time using the Odyssey Star. Again, this is from the Star Trek The Lost Era novel, One Constant Star. The ship's last commander was Captain Thomas Johnson Jr., who took command in the early 2320s. The ship's assignment under Johnson was the patrol of the Cardassian border. The ship was therefore able to render assistance to the Bajoran refugees in 2328. When Cardassian annexed Bajor the following year, the ship was lost in deep space shortly after the crew contacted some unknown infection. Star Trek reference, the USS Enterprise Owner's Workshop Manual. The FASA RPG module, Star Trek The Next Generation's Officer Manual, has a different account of the 1701B's demise. According to the RPG sourcebook, on the reference Stardate 2-9202.12, the Enterprise B engaged two hostile battleships, a Klingon L-24 class and a Romulan Z-1 class, in the Triangle Sector, about five parsecs from the space of the Imperial Klingon States. Both vessels were defeated, but the Enterprise was also lost with critical battle damage. The upshot of the encounter was the end of the IKS activity in the area. As the rebel government could not afford to lose any more capital ships after two large-scale vessels were claimed by the Enterprise battle. Thank you for watching the history of the USS Enterprise MCC-1701B. Thank you very much to Memory Beta for providing the information you heard today. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you can. If you already did, thank you. And have a nice day. Bye-bye. The History of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701C The Enterprise-C was a 24th century Federation Ambassador class starship operated by Starfleet. This was the fourth Federation starship to bear the name Enterprise. In 2344, Captain Rachel Garrett served as the ship's commanding officer. Not long following its launch in 2332, the Enterprise C, under the command of Captain Rachel Garrett, encountered three vessels representing an unknown alien race while exploring a binary star system. 
The unknown ships deployed an array of probes against the Enterprise, causing the deaths of several crew members. Despite this, the Enterprise still managed to destroy several of the probes and escape back to Federation space. This was from Enterprise Log's short story, Hour of Fire. In late 2335 or early 2336, First Officer Nigel Holmes was killed in a raid by Klingon renegades and replaced by Commander Samir Al Helk. Samir became involved with the Asfar Huatala cartel while taking shore leave on Farless Prime and was later captured by the Quatala agents who posed as Starfleet intelligence operatives. These false agents then had the Enterprise-C dispatched to the Dravi Nebula Cluster. There, the Enterprise discovered a disabled Atwilin colony ship. The Enterprise rescued the colonists and transferred them to the USS Balki. Alerted to the ruse after the rescue, the Enterprise tracked Samir to a dead pre-Cardassian world where they discovered Captain Garrett's ex-husband, Vin Calderon, attempting to find a portal that would have been used by the Hebeans to travel from this world to Cardassian Prime. Alien entities attacked the Enterprise away team, and Calderon sacrificed himself so the rest of the crew could escape. This was from Star Trek The Lost Era novel, Well of Souls. In 2344, the Enterprise responded to a distress call from the Klingon outpost on Norelda III, which was under attack by the Romulan Star Empire. When the Enterprise arrived at the outpost, she was engaged by four Romulan warbirds. The ship suffered major damage to her warp nacelles and external hull, with 125 crew members surviving. During the firefight, a temporal rift was created. The ship entered it and almost instantly emerged from it. This had the effect of creating an alternate timeline. Severely damaged, the Enterprise traveled through the rift, emerging in the year 2366, precisely 22 years, 3 months, and 4 days later, and encountered her successor, the Galaxy-class USS Enterprise D. The crew discovered that the outpost at Norelda III had been completely destroyed and the state of war existed between the Klingon Empire and the Federation. Both crews eventually realized that the current timeline was a result of the Enterprise-C's absence from the battle, and determined that the Enterprise-C needed to return to their own time through the rift. While the Enterprise-D assisted in repairs, both ships soon came under attack from the Klingons, and Captain Rachel Garrett was subsequently killed. Lieutenant Natasha Yar, the Enterprise-D's tactical officer, learned from Guinan, that if the Enterprise-C was successful in the new timeline that would be created, she would die a meaningless death. Not comfortable with that idea, Yar requested and was granted a transfer to the Enterprise-C. The last surviving officer of the Enterprise-C was Lieutenant Richard Castile, who assumed command of the ship under the protection of the Enterprise-D and took her back into the rift in 2344. The Enterprise-C returned to the same time that it had left, 2344, and it engaged the Romulans and was eventually destroyed. In the aftermath of the battle, the Klingons were deeply impressed by the act of self-sacrifice by a Starfleet crew to protect a Klingon outpost, and the Federation's ultimate legacy was reinforcing the relations between the Klingon Empire and the United Federation of Planets, leading to a close alliance of peace. A number of ship's crew members, including Yar, were captured by the Romulans and held prisoner. Yar later gave birth to a half-Romulan daughter named Sela. Starfleet would not commission another Enterprise until nearly two decades later in 2363. Sculptures of the Enterprise-C and other Enterprises later adorned the walls of the observation lounges on both the USS Enterprise-D until 2368 and the USS Enterprise-E launched in 2372. Apocrypha A dedication plaque was made by Michael Okuda for the bridge set. However, due to camera angles and lighting conditions, it was unreadable. The plaque made an appearance in the Star Trek Encyclopedia, 4th edition, volume 1, page 192. In the Star Trek Online mission Temporal Ambassador, it was revealed that the Enterprise-D's battle with the Klingons in yesterday's Enterprise caused the Enterprise-C to emerge from the Temporal Rift in 2409 rather than 2344. The alternate timeline remained in place, and the Federation had fallen to the Klingon Empire. 
However, the Klingon Empire, including former Federation and Romulan Star Empire, had been conquered by the Dominion. The Tholian Assembly holds the Enterprise C at a base in the Azure Nebula, and the players join forces with Richard Castile and Tasha Yar to take the Enterprise C back through another temporal rift once more to restore the timeline. Also in Star Trek Online, a plaque commemorating the Enterprise C can be seen inside certain fleet star bases. According to the plaque, she was launched in 2332, the date given in the Lost Era novel Well of Souls. Absolutely my favorite mission in Star Trek Online. And you get a free ship. Thank you for watching the history of the USS Enterprise C. You all have a great day. Much obliged to those who like, share, and subscribe. Those subscribers who have already subscribed, thank you very much. Bye-bye. The History of the USS Enterprise D The USS Enterprise NCC-1701D was a 24th century Federation Galaxy class starship operated by Starfleet, and the fifth Federation starship to bear the name Enterprise. During her career, the Enterprise served as a Federation flagship. The Enterprise was destroyed during the Battle of Viridian III in 2371. The Enterprise was built at Utopia Planitia Fleet Yards orbiting Mars in the Sol system. The construction was a massive undertaking involving thousands of people across multiple disciplines. Dr. Leah Brahms was responsible for much of the Enterprise's warp propulsion system design. Some of the Enterprise's components were diverged from technology originally developed on the USS Pegasus. In an alternate timeline, the Enterprise was the first Galaxy-class warship constructed. In the year 2363, the Enterprise was launched from Mars. Final system completion and shakedown was conducted at Earth Station McKinley. Captain Jean-Luc Picard took command of the ship on Stardate 41148 at the order of Rear Admiral Nora Sati. Technical data. With a total of 42 decks, the USS Enterprise D was twice the length and had eight times the interior space of the Constitution-class ships of over a century earlier. She carried a combined crew and passenger load of 1,012. The bridge, captain's ready room, and conference lounge were on deck one and were protected by redundant safety interlocks to prevent environmental system failure. The main shuttle bay was on Deck 4, supported by several cargo bays on Deck 4 and Deck 18. Two additional shuttle bays were found on Deck 13. Deck 8 of the ship was an unfinished multi-purpose deck. Additional workspaces were set there when needed. It also contained the officers' quarters, some guest quarters, and the battle bridge. Deck 12 contained sick bay and the gymnasium while main engineering was located on deck 36. Engineering took up 12 decks on the secondary hull with the antimatter storage pods housed on deck 42. There was also a science section on deck 15. The primary docking ports were located on either side of the photon torpedo launcher on deck 25. The nacelle control room was also on that deck. The Enterprise had a maximum sustainable speed of warp 9.6 for 12 hours. In 2369, the ship generated about 12.75 billion gigawatts of power simply while in orbit of a planet. The warp core could generate a tremendous amount of energy at once if needed. The only device on the ship capable of channeling such energy all at once at controlled frequencies was the main deflector dish. There were some 4,000 power systems in all on board the ship. She also had 20 transporter rooms, with at least one on Deck 6. The armaments of the Enterprise D included 12 phaser arrays, two photon torpedo launchers, a supply of 250 photon torpedoes, and hundreds of antimatter mines. The ship was protected by a high capacity shield grid that could operate on multiple frequencies. When the ship was destroyed in 2371, the shield frequency was at 257.4 MHz. 
In extreme cases, the saucer could separate and serve tactically as a second attack vessel, utilizing the large phaser arrays located on its hull. The engineering section also had phaser banks, but more often utilized its fore and aft torpedo tubes as its main weapon systems. This tactical method of attack utilizing ship separation was further developed for the Prometheus-class starships. The bulk of the people on board the Enterprise could be evacuated within four minutes. This was executed at Starbase 74 during 2364. During extreme situations, certain large but protected areas of the ship were designated emergency shelters. Collectively, they could hold all of the ship's crew and were designed so that the crew could reach one of the areas quickly. In 2367, while caught in a Tykins rift, the crew were ordered to these areas in order to get extra power from life support in non-shelter areas. In 2367, an average day on board the starship recorded by Lieutenant Commander Data included four birthdays, two personnel transfers, two chess tournaments, a secondary school play, four performances, and at least one berth. The Enterprise normally ran on three duty shifts. Increasing to four duty shifts caused many personnel scheduling problems as observed when Captain Jellico ordered a change during his tenure in 2369. Crew members of ensign rank were required to share crew quarters, but were allowed their own quarters upon promotion to lieutenant junior grade. Families often shared quarters. 10 forward, located at the extreme forward of deck 10 in the saucer section, was the center of the ship's social activity nearly everyone on board passed through the lounge at one time or another. Holodecks located on deck 10 and deck 12 also provided entertainment for the crew. Background Information The Enterprise D model was designed by Andrew Probert. The basic layout of the ship was diverged from a painting Probert had done following Star Trek The Motion Picture of how he would redesign the Enterprise if he had been allowed to break with the basic plan. When he was hired to work in Star Trek The Next Generation Art Department, he brought the painting with him and hung it in his office, then set to work on the design of the bridge. Out of pure luck, David Gerald saw the painting and brought it to Gene Roddenberry's attention. Roddenberry immediately approved the general direction. Probert further refined the design into the familiar shape. However, he originally conceived of the battle section as a smaller vessel shaped like a D, which detached from the area on the saucer. Later, the producers informed him that they wanted the ship to split in two and have the engineering hull serve as a battle section. This presented an additional problem for Probert as he needed to figure out some way to fulfill the producer's request while keeping the original lines of the design. Eventually, he found a way to incorporate a separation using the approved design. And after several more minor changes, the design reached its final form. Roddenberry's only requests were to lengthen the ends of the warp nacelles and to keep the bridge on the top of the saucer section rather than within the ship. Roddenberry felt that having the bridge on the exterior gave some sense of scale to the vessel. Two versions of filming miniatures were built by the Industrial Light and Magic for the first season. A large six-foot model and a smaller, less detailed two-foot model. The cost to construct the original models was $75,000. For the third season, Greg Jen built a new four-foot miniature. It was not built to separate, but it was the first time it accurately depicted the ten forward windows. It first appeared in TNG's The Defector and completely replaced the previous two models, although stock footage of the original models was still used. The six-foot model was briefly reused for the saucer separation in The Best of Both Worlds Part 2. It was completely refurbished and overhauled for Star Trek Generations, where it represented the Enterprise alongside the computer-generated version and a special 12-foot wide saucer created for the crash sequence. ILM crew member Bill George relabeled the registry number on the saucer to NCC-1701E before the model was returned to Paramount Archives. The four-foot model was modified into the three warp nacelled Enterprise from All Good Things and was later partially restored to become the USS Odyssey in the DS9 episode The Jim Adar and the USS Venture in The Way of the Warrior. The original six-foot filming model of the Enterprise-D 
was sold at the 40 Years of Star Trek The Collection Auction on October 7, 2006 for $576,000. It was by far the highest price for any item at the auction. During the early planning stages of Next Generation, it was intended for the series to be set in the late 25th century. The Enterprise D would have been the seventh Federation starship to bear the name, with the registry number of NCC 1701 7. After the release of Star Trek IV The Voyage Home, featuring the USS Enterprise A, the designation was changed to NCC 1701 G before the producers finally moved the series to 80 years after the original series and settled on NCC 1701 D. There was also talk of eliminating the Starship from TNG series altogether and merely boasting of the abilities of the transporter, but this idea was quickly dropped. The interior sets were supervised by Herman Zimmerman during the first season and Star Trek Generations. Andrew Probert also contributed design sketches, most importantly for the bridge. Richard James took over the role from the second season until the end of the series. Many sets were recycled from those created by Harold Michelson for Star Trek The Motion Picture and the aborted Star Trek Phase II. In turn, many of the Enterprise D sets were transformed into those of the USS Voyager for Star Trek Voyager. The Enterprise D had a captain's yacht named the Calypso. It was never actually seen due to budget restrictions, but it can be seen on the underneath side of the saucer section. Thank you for watching the history of the Enterprise D. Please like and subscribe and share if you can. And have a great day. Bye bye. History of the USS Enterprise E. The USS Enterprise NCC 1701E was a 24th century sovereign class starship operated by Starfleet. This was the sixth Federation starship to bear the name Enterprise. On Stardate 49827.5, the sovereign class Enterprise E was seen as a pinnacle of Starfleet ship design was launched from San Francisco Fleet Yards with Captain Jean-Luc Picard in command once more. Much more of the crew of the Enterprise D had been assigned there, including almost the entire senior staff. The sole exception was Lieutenant Commander Worf, who had already transferred to the space station Deep Space Nine. After almost a year in space, the Enterprise was ordered to the Romulan Neutral Zone during the second Borg incursion. Starfleet was officially concerned about the possibility of Romulan military action since many of the available ships had been diverted to fight the Borg, but in reality Starfleet was concerned about Picard's presence at the battle. However, shortly after the Federation fleet had engaged the Borg cube, Picard disobeyed orders and returned to Earth to assist the fleet. Once there, Picard became aware of the battle including the weakness in the Borg cube due to his residual link to the Collective and ordered all ships in the fleet to concentrate their fire at that one section of the ship. As a result, the Borg vessel was destroyed, and the Battle of Sector 001 was a victory for Starfleet. Before the Borg cube was destroyed, it had launched a second vessel towards Earth. This ship created a temporal vortex and traveled back to the year 2063 in order to stop Zephyrin Cochran from launching his historic warp ship, the Phoenix. Their hope was to prevent the first contact with the Vulcans and assimilate Earth before the Federation could be formed to resist them. The Enterprise protected Protected from alterations in the timeline by the Vortex, chased the Borg into the pass and destroyed their ship, then sent an away team to help protect Cochran and repair the Phoenix. However, the ship's sensors and shields were damaged during the trip through the Vortex, and unbeknownst to the crew, several Borg drones transported aboard the Enterprise before their ship exploded. They began to assimilate the ship's engineering section below Deck 10. 
They also attempted to build an interplexing beacon on the Enterprise deflector dish to contact the Borg Collective of that time period. A three-man away team led by Captain Picard stopped the beacon from being completed and separated the deflector from the ship by disengaging the magnetic locks and then destroying it. However, the Borg's ability to adapt to the handheld weapons of the Enterprise crew made stopping them impossible, and Picard realized that the fight was a lost cause. After great consideration, he reluctantly ordered the evacuation of the ship and activated the ship's auto-destruct sequence to prevent the Borg from interfering with the Phoenix flight. He eventually confronted the Borg Queen in main engineering, only to find to his horror that the Borg had apparently turned Lieutenant Commander Data to their side. He aborted the auto-destruct and fired three quantum torpedoes at the Phoenix. However, the torpedoes completely missed their target and Data revealed that he had in fact simply been deceiving the Borg. After mockingly repeating the Borg mantra, resistance is futile, Data smashed open the plasma conduit tank, flooding main engineering with the plasma coolant and liquefying the Borg Queen and all drones in engineering. This apparently disabled all other drones on the ship and allowed Data and Picard to recapture the vessel. The Enterprise crew was successful in helping Cochrane make his flight and instigate first contact with the Vulcans. The ship then returned to 2373 where she was repaired and then returned to service. With the Federation diplomatic corps attempting to negotiate an end to the Dominion War, the Enterprise was relegated to a diplomatic role, much to the dissatisfaction of Picard. In 2375, the Enterprise was conducting a diplomatic mission with the Evrola, a new Federation protectorate species, and was scheduled to resolve a dispute in the Gorin system when her crew became embroiled in a plot by the Sona. Assisted by Starfleet Admiral Matthew Donnery to forcibly remove the Baku from their isolated world in the Briar Patch. The Sona turned out to be a vengeful former Baku who had been exiled from the planet after their failed coup a century prior. They planned to harvest metaphasic radiation from the planet's ring system and intended Starfleet's cooperation to carry out the plan. Captain Picard felt that the relocation of the Baku was a severe violation of the Prime Directive and resigned his command mission, leading an away team of the Enterprise crew members to the Baku planet to prevent their capture and removal. Commander William T. Riker was instructed to take the Enterprise and contact the Federation Council to alert them of Admiral Donneray's treachery. However, the Enterprise was required to navigate an area of space known as the Briar Patch in order to contact Starfleet Command. This area disrupted communications as well as the ship's impulse drive. Two Sona battlecruisers were sent to intercept the Enterprise before she left the Briar Patch and severely damaged the ship in the process. The warp core was ejected in order to seal a dangerous tear in subspace created by the isoletic weapons of the Sona. Riker was able to outwit the Sona by collecting Metrion gas native to the Briar Patch and then venting it behind the ship. When the Sona used their weapons, the gas exploded, destroying one ship and severely damaging the other. Geordi LaForge half-jokingly commented that the tactic could become known as the Riker Maneuver. The Enterprise visited Earth for several days in 2376 around the time of the Pathfinder Project and made contact with the USS Voyager and conducted a mission about seven light years from Earth the following year. According to Deanna Troy, it was an important mission but the objective was never discussed. Sometime between 2375 and 2379, the Enterprise underwent a major refit. Four additional aft-facing photon torpedo tubes were added along with one more forward-facing photon tube a twin launcher at the aft of the bridge, a single launcher above the aft hangar deck, and a single launcher at the forward base of the bridge. Additionally, new nacelle pylons were fitted at the time, slightly longer, broader, and more sharply swept than the originals, and fitted with four additional phaser arrays. In 2379, the Enterprise returned to Earth for the wedding of William T. Riker and Deanna Troy. She departed for Beta Z, where another ceremony, a traditional Betazoid wedding, was scheduled. While en route, the ship detected unusual positronic signals from the Kalaran system, discovering another Soon-type android, the prototype B-4. Shortly following, the Enterprise was ordered to Romulus for a meeting with the new Praetor Shinzon, who apparently wanted to initiate peace talks. 
Both the discovery of B4 and the peace overtures turned out to be a ruse to capture Captain Picard and discover tactical positions of Starfleet vessels. Once it became clear that Shenzhen was going to use his starship, the Scimitar, to destroy all life on Earth and wage war on the Federation, the Enterprise was to join the Starfleet battle group Omega and make a final stand against Shenzhen. Shinzon caught up to the Enterprise in the Bassin Roof, and in the ensuing confrontation, the vessel was severely damaged, including a major hull breach on the bridge, destroying the view screen and controls, disabling the warp core. As a last resort, Picard ordered Counselor Deanna Troy to take control of the Enterprise and have it ram the scimitar, causing the destruction of most of the saucer section's forward area. The collision disabled the scimitar, but Shinzon, driven by revenge, activated his deadly Thaler on weapon and trained it on the Enterprise. The weapon was overloaded and the scimitar was destroyed due to interference by Commander Data, who sacrificed himself to save the Enterprise, Picard, and indirectly Earth. Following the scimitar incident, the Enterprise returned to Earth where it underwent extensive repairs in one of the orbiting space docks. Technical Information in her original configuration, the Enterprise E was under 700 meters long and had 24 decks, according to Jean-Luc Picard, although Deck 26 was reported as being controlled by the Borg. She was equipped with 12 phaser arrays and 5 photon torpedo tubes. By 2379, the Enterprise E had undergone at least one refit, including 4 additional phaser arrays and 5 additional photon torpedo tubes. The number of decks was also increased to 5, a minimum of 29, by Star Trek Nemesis. Sections included deflector controls, stellar cartography, hydroponics, and one sickbay ward. Main engineering and sickbay were on deck 16. The ship could be controlled by a manual steering column located on the bridge. She was also the first Enterprise to be equipped with an emergency medical hologram. The Enterprise carried a newer design of shuttlecraft as well as numerous other forms of transportation, including warp-capable Captain's Yacht, the Clouseau, and a special multi-purpose shuttlecraft, the Argo. The yacht was installed as part of the saucer section and detached upon deployment. Other auxiliary craft were launched from two shuttle bays. The 10-foot physical model constructed under the supervision of John Goodson at Industrial Light and Magic was used for the visual effects shots during Star Trek First Contact, alongside a CGI model in Insurrection and Star Trek Nemesis. CGI versions of the ship completely replaced the physical model. The model of the Enterprise-E from Star Trek First Contact was sold at the 40 Years of Star Trek The Collection auction on October 5th, 2006 for $132,000, including the buyer's premium. Sovereign Class Dimensions It is apparent from the lineup charts that every new Starship Enterprise is slightly longer than the previous one. In Star Trek First Contact, Picard informs Lily that the Enterprise-E is almost 700 meters long in accordance with its intended size of 2,248 feet or 685 meters. Apocrypha In Star Trek Countdown, the Enterprise was still active as of 2387 with Data as captain, having been revived after successfully imprinting his neural network into B4's existing CPU. The timeline for Star Trek Online follows the storyline in the Countdown comic series with Data as captain into the 25th century. The timeline only mentions that the Enterprise-E left service around 2408, but its ultimate fate was unclear. However, by 2409, a new Odyssey-class vessel christened the USS Enterprise NCC-1701F, implying that her predecessor was decommissioned or destroyed. That concludes the history of the USS Enterprise-E.
Welcome to the history of the USS Enterprise F. The USS Enterprise NCC 1701 F was a 24th century Federation starship, an Odyssey class vessel launched in the year 2409 under the command of Captain Vakel Sean. History Captain Data was offered command of the vessel but ultimately refused. From the Star Trek Online short story, Unexpected Honor. Following the destruction of the USS Belfast, Captain Sean and many of the other surviving crew members of that ship were reassigned to the newly launched Starship Enterprise, on Data's recommendation. One of the ship's first engagements was as part of a fleet to retake Deep Space Nine from a brief accidental Dominion occupation of the station. The station was successfully recovered. The Enterprise deployed Sean to an Iconian gateway on New Romulus. Sean's first officer, Commander Samuel Winters, subsequently commanded the ship in a battle against the Alechi fleet that entered the Jorat system through a space gate. After the battle was over, the Enterprise scanned the gateway only to have its computers automatically lock up in accordance with the Omega device after detecting Omega particles. Later, the Enterprise followed the RRW Lycast and the IKS Bortus skew through another gate over the star at the center of the Solancy Dyson Sphere and engaged the Udine that blasted its way into the Jolan Dyson Sphere. Sean then became embroiled in a three-way standoff with the other two flagship captains over a political control over the sphere, which was temporarily defused by some fast talking by Rear Admiral Tuvok. The Enterprise F later returned to the Janolan Dyson Sphere as part of the Federation delegation to discuss the ownership of the spheres as well as the threat posed by the Udine. The summit was cut short when a massive Udine armada appeared using the Iconian Gateway in the Jolnolan Sphere to enter the Alpha Quadrant and launch an assault on Earth. The Enterprise F secured the moon while flagships of the Romulan Republic and Klingon Empire eliminated the Udine vessels over Earth. Once it was discovered that the attack was a diversion to the Udine's true target of Kronos, the Enterprise gathered as many Starfleet vessels as possible before heading to the Klingon homeworld to assist in the counterattack. During the battle, the Udine received a massive new planet killer. Captain Sean used the Enterprise aquatic attack craft to destroy it by ramming it head on. Later that year, the Enterprise F participated in Starfleet's final stand against the Iconians in the Sol system. In alternate timelines, other versions of the Enterprise F entered service in the late 24th or early 25th centuries. Alternate Year 2382 to 2388 in the DS9 Millennium novel, in the War of the Prophets timeline, encountered by the crew of the USS Defiant in 2374. The Enterprise F was launched in 2382 following the destruction of the USS Enterprise E and was commanded by Admiral Jean-Luc Picard, who was later succeeded by Captain William T. Riker. The Enterprise was lost with all hands, including Tom Paris, Geordi LaForge, and Deanna Troy, when the Gagardi destroyed Earth in 2388. The ship was the first of its class, and it was stated that it was the defiant to the 10th power. It also possessed a multi-vector assault mode, built with the purpose of combating the Gagari threat. The timeline in which this vessel existed was aborted when the Defiant returned to its own time and the red wormholes were destroyed. Another timeline from the year 2408 from the next generation novel Imzadi. In the Imzadi timeline encountered by the crew of the USS Enterprise D in 2368, the Enterprise F was in service in 2408 and was commanded by Commodore Data. In this timeline, the Enterprise F had a crew of 2,023. The timeline in which this ship existed was aborted when Deanna Troy was saved from death in 2368. That concludes the history of the USS Enterprise F.
Welcome to the history of the USS Enterprise J. The USS Enterprise NCC-1701J was a 26th century Federation Universe-class starship operated by Starfleet in a possible future. The Enterprise J participated in the historic battle of Priclon 5, wherein the forces of the Federation successfully drove back the Sphere Builders back to their transdimensional realm. In 2154, as Captain Jonathan Archer of the Enterprise NX-01 was preparing to undertake a suicide mission to destroy the Zindi weapon in the Delphiric Expanse, Temporal Agent Daniels transported Archer to the Enterprise J to witness the battle, while the vessel was in a trans-dimensional disturbance. It was Daniel's hope that Archer could be convinced to abandon his suicide mission and attempt to make peace with the Zendi, informing Archer that without him the Federation would never come into existence and the Sphere Builders would remain unopposed. Archer was unconvinced, however, and demanded that Daniels return him to his own time. Daniels also revealed that there were Zindi serving on the Enterprise J. An initiation medal Daniels gave Archer belonged to one of these crew members. Background Information Since the Star Trek Enterprise writing staff was pressed for time, there wasn't a lot of deliberation over naming this vessel. Manny Cotto later reflected, we were just sitting around the room and said, what should it be? J? Okay. Star Trek Communicator Issue 152, page 50. Apocrypha. The 2005 Star Trek Ships of the Line calendar featured a specially created, fully rendered image of the Enterprise J in flight. The Enterprise J appears in Agents of Yesterday, the third expansion to Star Trek Online. After pursuing the Temporal Liberation Front, made up of the Sphere Builders, the Nakul, the Vorgons, and the Kremen, Throughout time and space, the player character travels to the 26th century to defeat them at the Battle of Priclon 5. With the aid of Starfleet legends and temporal agents, Montgomery Scott and Pavel Chekhov, the player installs the Taksu Tot on board the Enterprise J, which allows it to destroy the Sphere Builder's spheres and dissipate their expanse in the Prylar system. The USS Enterprise J is captained by a female Join Trill. She is the future host of the Dax Symbiote. 